Today is Tuesday, December the 11th, 2012. I'm Matthew TG. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to The Technology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 184. So, uh, Heath is kind of with us today, but almost like the ghost of Christmas That's past. what I was going to say. He's with us in spirit, and that spirit is... The Christmas spirit. So, yeah. Heath, how are you doing? Yeah. We noticed we didn't say your name. How are you doing over there, man? Yeah. Look, and not even really a smile on his face. Kind of this inquisitive little, no. yeah, not quite sure. It's as though he's seen something so horrible yeah. that words cannot describe yeah. what the, he just witnessed. Yeah, I've Literally just, frozen in Let fear. me tell you, this is the handy word of Master TG. He's done a wonderful job here. Yeah. The producer's got to do something. When there's <laughs> nobody to fill the chair, we have to do something uh, I can't, to make it work. I can't wait for him to see that. Yeah, Heath was out last week. He had a funeral he had to attend, and then uh, his son is sick and was going to join us via Skype, but then... Um, uh, his son is has gotten worse, and so I had to take him to the doctor this morning. So we certainly wish him well. <laughs> All right, listen. I uh, want to talk about our giveaway. Uh, it's active up on the website right now. This is the, the most recent uh, biography on Bonhoeffer, uh, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. This is a great book. Now, it's pretty pretty thick there, you can see. Um, I think we have close to 100 entries on this already. Um, you can enter as many times as you want. Right, if you, so there's multiple that doesn't mean 100 people that you're fighting against. Uh, I know Seth Cotton probably accounts for about 75 of those 100. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to our, our website uh, and look at, uh, just click on the giveaways tab there. Um, I actually got this book in, in three versions. So the art copy, Kindle, um, also on Audible. Um, I, I consumed it through Audible, but then I would come home and bookmark areas. I would just note it on the audio and a uh, great, great, great book. Uh, you will love this, and so be sure to enter for that. All right, today we want to welcome to the show um, Asbury Theological Seminary President Dr. Timothy C. Tennant. He took office on July the 1st, 2009. He previously served 11 years as Professor of World Missions and Indian Studies at Gordon Cronwell Theological Seminary in South Hamilton, Massachusetts. Prior to his work in Massachusetts, Dr. Tennant taught missions at Toccoa Falls College in Georgia, where he was honored as Teacher of the Year in 1995. He also teaches annually at the Luther W. New Junior Theological College at Dehradun, I believe that's pronounced, Dehradun, India, where he has served as an adjunct professor since 1989. He's also ministered and taught in China, Thailand, Nigeria, Eastern Europe, He's ordained in the United Methodist Church. He's pastored churches in Georgia and preached regularly in churches throughout New England and across the country. Dr. Tennant, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. Thanks a lot, Tony. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite a resume. Uh, hey, did I did I pronounce that right? Is it Duradun? It is Duradun. That's exactly right. All righty. Yeah. Listen, as we begin today, um, let's let's talk about. Now, I'm, I'm an Asbury grad, and so um, I've gotten to know you, you know, from from that perspective. And uh, many of us just feel fortunate to have you there as president. Why don't we start by you just talking about your spiritual journey that eventually, you know, got you to Asbury? Well, thank you. It's great to be here on this episode 184. Um, I was actually born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1959. I grew up in a, uh, a Jewish community in Atlanta. I uh, attended a Methodist church in downtown Atlanta and actually came to the Lord through a lay Bible study in the, um, 1977. I went on from there to Young Harris College, a small Methodist college up in uh, North Georgia Mountains. And I then, it's there that I actually received a call into the ministry in 1979. I went on to uh, Oral Roberts University and then on from there to uh, Gordon Conwell where I got my MDiv degree and then started a minister, pastoral ministry in the North Georgia Conference. So I served for quite a few years uh, in the North Georgia Conference as a pastor. Uh, during that time I was uh, going to India and started in the um, late 80s to uh, Work help pioneer a Bible college there, which we officially opened in '89. I've been teaching there every year since then. So that's been a big part of my uh, life and formation, just exposure to the global church, particularly the Indian church. I later did a, a THM in Islam at Princeton and taught at Tacoma Falls College. 
And then I went on uh, later and did my uh, doctoral work in University of Edinburgh in Hinduism and focused particularly on the Christian response to Hinduism, which was grew out of my work in India. Sure. And I uh, continued to work in India, helping to train pastors to more effectively communicate the gospel to uh, Hindus. And then I was uh, called to, uh, to lead the missions program at Gordon-Conwell, which I did for 11 years. And so it was after those 11 years at Gordon-Conwell that I then came to, um, to Asbury. I also, in the process of my life, I had uh, five different, um, uh, even as a professor, pastorates where I was an interim pastor of churches in New England, which helped me to really see some of the changes of the contemporary church life that were very different from when I was a pastor back in the 80s. So I came to Asbury in 2009. It's been a great experience, a great ministry here, and Asbury truly is a remarkable institution with now a, a, over 9,000 graduates around the world, which you're one of many of our proud graduates, yeah. Tony. Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm interested. Now, when I was a student there, I was a student from 89 to 93 and uh, really grew to admire the work of the Siemens family in the country of India. I'm wondering, you know, in your time of service in India, did you, um, were there any paths that kind of crossed there in terms of seeing some of the work that uh, Tata Siemens and, and John T. Siemens and others did in India? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it actually has a lot of connections to my wife, uh, more so than myself. My wife, uh, her uh, aunt spent 33 years in India and did work in the South and actually served under Tata Siemens. Okay. And she knew the whole Siemens family and they were very, very close. Um, my work uh, has been in North India and so therefore it's a very different part of India. Dehradun is the extreme northern part of India close to China and Nepal, whereas the Siemens worked in South India. So um, in my own work in India, I haven't had any contact with the Siemens work, but in my wife's family, I was very well aware of their work and sure. how respected they were in South India. Yeah. Now, you know, here's a here's a question um, I, I love to ask someone like you. I mean, you're an author, you're a preacher, you're a missionary, you're a seminary <laughs> president. So if I brought you into a meeting with people and had you describe yourself, how would you describe yourself? At, at the end of the day, I mean, what is your core? What is your passion? Well, I often jokingly say I couldn't decide whether I wanted to grow up and be a pastor or a missionary <laughs> or a teacher, so I ended up doing all three. Uh, so I, I tend to vacillate uh, even to this day between my work in various fields. But I guess uh, in my core being, I am uh, committed to um, uh, communicating the gospel. Uh, that really is at the heart of who I am and finding ways to better communicate the gospel, especially to those who haven't heard uh, our life verse, my wife and I adopted a life verse early on our, in our married life, Romans 15, 21, where Paul said it was his ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not named so he would not build another man's foundation. So we always felt like that we uh, were called to extend the gospel to new areas, to, uh, to preach the gospel where it wasn't named. And, of course, theological education eventually grew out of that because uh, that's what we do. We, we train people to go to the ends of the earth yeah. with the gospel and... So my core work is really about communicating the gospel, very concerned about uh, our faithfulness to historic orthodoxy and producing a faith that's uh, sustainable and reproducible. And so I think sooner education is a vital uh, way of serving the church in producing uh, orthodox, sustainable, and, orth and reproducible faith. And that's driven much of my, my life and work, whether it be teaching seminary in India or teaching a seminary here in the U.S. Yeah, I, I um, would just be interested in you know some of your thoughts here, comments. But one of the things that I've often said when you get to the Orthodox faith, um, one of the dangers it seems to me is when we strip that away, um, then a question of relevance for the church begins to arise. Because if if um, if, if we take these core beliefs away from the church and say that they're not part of them, then it seems to me that at, at its essence you then are left as a social club. And it, as you look around within communities and cities and towns where we live, there are many options and other organizations can, that can do that kind of work. But when you, when you, you know, hone in on the, the orthodox tenets of the faith and also the calling of the church, it seems to me that it is the only 
um, institution within the society that answers that burning question for humanity. Yeah, absolutely. The, the core message of the church is to preach Christ and Him crucified. So that is at the core of who we are and what it means. And when I first went to North India, they all uh, encouraged us, don't build a school. They said, uh, who, we don't need a seminary up here. They said, uh, what you need to do is uh, build an orphanage. We need orphanages. Uh, we resisted that, and uh, we started a seminary. And, of course, our graduates have, have gone out and planted dozens of, semin- uh, dozens of orphanages. Yeah. So the great thing about the gospel is that when the gospel is properly preached, it does bear fruit in innumerable social concerns, areas that we all believe are important to be addressed. But that's the power of the gospel. It transforms that and makes that possible in society. So we don't really see the, uh, the dichotomy. Sure. When you preach Christ properly, it does bear fruit in the whole of life. Yeah, and certainly from the, uh, you know, my domination is the Wesleyan Church, and from that context, um, a heritage through Wesley, the heritage to the founders of the Wesleyan Church in terms of their social, um, you know, being out there socially and being active, it was the gospel that spurred them to do that. So you know, in my comments, I might just affirm what you said, in no way, and for those that have listened to the show regularly, in no way am, am I saying that, um, you know, the social issues stay to the side, but quite the contrary, that they are heightened and they are intensified when the gospel is the impetus for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, let's turn our attention to theological education. Um, first, uh, one of the things that's really encouraged me since my years at Asbury is the partnerships that Asbury Seminary has gotten around the world. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, Asbury believes that uh, because of the emerging global church where today uh, almost 70 percent of Christians globally are in the uh, majority world or the non-Western world, this has huge implications for a place like Asbury, which is increasingly located in the mission field, as North America is the fastest growing mission field in the world, and also the need for pastors and, tra- and teachers around the world. Uh, we haven't really had a situation where the church has grown this rapidly, where there are no training institutions since the Reformation. And Martin Luther famously once said in a kind of a moment of exasperation that if he knew a man who knew the Ten Commandments, he'd make him a pastor, <laughs> because the uh, the need for training for pastors was so great, and he just couldn't find people properly trained. So, Asbury has entered into par- six partnerships around the world. We'll ha- we have two of these in Africa, uh, AIU, African International University in uh, Nairobi, uh, the West Africa Theological Seminary in Lagos, Nigeria, and then we have uh, in Costa Rica the Methodist Seminary there. Uh, we also have a connection with the Seoul Theological Seminary in Korea, and then the Asia Graduate School of Theology in the Philippines, and then the new uh, Theological College in Dehradun, North India, where I've taught. So these schools really put us around the world. Yeah. Uh, we will exchange professors. We'll exchange students. We exchange resources, digital library materials. A lot of ways we're trying to strengthen the global church and allow them to... Um, to have a stronger uh, role in training people, as well as them in strengthening our own faculty, as our own faculty be globalized a lot through this process. So we see it being very, very um, helpful for Asbury's future. Uh, also, too, don't you think for the um, seminary right here in the States, in Kentucky and then in Orlando, um, it certainly helps to inform the uh, um, a, a broader understanding of the church globally um, I think a lot of times here in the States, it's easy for us to get isolated um, and even forget that the church outside of America is where it's happening and, and, and where it's exploding. That's right. It not only does it help us to invest in the growth of the global church with well-trained leaders, but uh, whenever you bring Christians from around the world uh, to the North America, they have a way of exposing our own blind spots, uh, the ways we domesticated the gospel yeah. and not heard it properly. Right. There's many, many ways they deliver us from our own ideas of the success syndrome of how churches are judged uh, in the West. There are many, many ways in which the global church can help us uh, be better Christians here and help us be better evangelists and church planters because we're, we, it's been a long time since North America was regarded as a mission field. And so for us to now be in an emerging mission context, yep. it takes a big, big change in the way pastors think about their communities, 
how they think about the, what it means to be a pastor of a church. Uh, in the Methodist tradition, typically bishops send people to churches rather than send them to communities. And so it's a real missional shift when a pastor sees himself or herself not as simply serving a local congregation, but being sent missionally to reach a whole community. And those, those are very important shifts, which the global church uh, is quite aware of and can help us in many ways. Yeah. You know, one of the things I love to point out to people, we've had opportunities to go speak at Southern Wesleyan University about our show and what we do. And I talk about you know, the dawn of the Internet, and it was the Internet that made what we do possible. Years ago, if you wanted to do a show, you were going to have to go through a television station. You're going to have to find someone that would finance that, produce it. And the Internet, is, it just changed all of that. You can take your product directly to the people. And I know that Internet technologies are beginning to impact or have impacted education in a big way. Talk a little bit about Internet technologies in the context of theological education. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's really, really important. Um, as you pointed out, uh, the old communication models were essentially what we call uh, vertical communication, which means people that had information taught and trained those who didn't have information. It was a very much a top-down process. The Internet has made us more of a democracy. It's flattened out communication, yep. so it's much more horizontal and vertical. Getting information with their peers, back and forth, um, less trust in hierarchies and institutions. So naturally, since education in a seminary is mostly hierarchical and is based on people coming to us and being trained by us, this is a really big change. Uh, Asbury began to address the change in 1990 when we founded our what we call our extended learning program, which seeks to essentially put an Asbury class uh, anywhere in the world where someone has access to the internet. Uh, we now have over 500 students who take classes online, wow. and that's been a real big bridge to seeking, seeking to um, you know, address the expectation today that education is more accessible. Uh, but accessibility is, of course, only one side of the coin. Um, accessibility is a very important part. The other part, of course, is formation. How do we form students? People aren't looking simply for uh, technically trained pastors that have information. They want them to be formed spiritually. So we're not only looking at ways in which uh, we can extend formation through intensive kind of com uh, trips to campus or uh, faculty holding retreats around the country, around the world, where our students are gathered. We have a lot of ways that we're seeking to connect uh, students to formative activities. So we think that um, the future of internet-based education is bright. Like everything else, though, it requires a lot of intentionality, yeah. a lot of hard work in terms of really achieving our, our objectives. Because in the case of Asbury, we our mission statement is simply not to theologically educate people, but also to send out people who are spirit-filled and, uh, and are sanctified. Well, that's a very different yeah. project, and so we're seeking to address that. Yeah, it seems to me that if if the educational institution is anything like the church, um, a lot of times what we struggle with at the denominational level is that you talk about the, the, the importance of spiritual formation, but at the end of the year when you're filling out reports, there's not really a, a, cat, uh, a category, there, an area that you fill out, and so it's easy to address all the business aspects of the church and and leave lagging behind the spiritual formation um, and I hadn't really thought about that. So even with online education, I, I guess that that's just an additional challenge. Um, do you think that's intensified within the Internet technologies world as opposed to the, the real world or, you know, the, the traditional academy? I think it has. I think it's uh, raised a lot of new questions about the objectives of education because yeah. uh, through Google, for example, uh, basically information is now accessible to anybody. So it used to be that uh, information itself was more proprietary, right. and therefore people paid to get that information. Today, I, mean, I think it was back in the uh, uh, what late 90s that MIT, which arguably has the most proprietary information on the planet, uh, decided to put all their courses online. Well, once MIT did that, it really changed, was a game changer because that created uh, a strong sense that uh, education is not simply about information. 
It's about how you reflect upon it, how you apply it, how you use yep. it. Yep. And that has changed a lot. And of course, I, I've obviously, education seminary is very much along those lines. How do we apply what we've learned to situations? And so the ability to interact with ministry practitioners, with missionaries, with people who have experience applying the Bible, applying the, our theology, church history to real situations, is really, really important part of formation. Yeah, that's a I mean, that's an interesting aspect and one that I hadn't really taken a lot of time to think about. You know, when we think of education, you think of just these things that you tick off the list, and once I'm done with all these courses, I get my degree. One of the um, challenges that we face uh, in with the ordination process is getting young men and young, uh, young women to understand when they come in the process, listen, you're not just checking things off a list. This is a formative process, and we're looking for more than just um, intellectual aptitude here. We're looking for you know, signs of gifts and graces that the Spirit of God has endowed upon you for ministry. That's right. Yeah, and, and that's that, that would be hard to gauge in the Internet world. That, yeah, that's fascinating. You can tell that, like, for me right now, I, had, I hadn't really thought about that whole piece. Hmm. Um, listen, I know one of the things that has really been encouraging to me is uh, how Asbury has taken very seriously this thing of uh, education for the laity. And talk to us for a little while here about a Seedbed. Yeah, thank you. Seedbed is uh, simply, essentially a, uh, an online publishing arm where Asbury is seeking to extend resource, Wesleyan resources uh, to all, all across the church. We're seeing a big gap between, uh, we'll say, Sunday school and seminary, that gap of lay people who really want to grow in their faith, be formed, but just don't have access to materials. And particularly, the Western materials have been very much lacking. So yeah. Seedbed is really pr uh, putting out a number of um, uh, published materials, both electronic and hard copy, to help resource the church. Uh, we also are developing uh, what we'll call Seedbed Academy, where we can actually produce a certificate program. So lay people who are interested in uh, having an education but maybe can't go to seminary could uh, go through a certificate program. We'll have uh, seabed conferences, and ultimately we're, our goal is to start a whole networking for church planters in the Wesleyan wow. tradition around the country. So we see seabed as really a, a resourcing platform uh, for in the Wesleyan tradition, which really will help to train people and equip people and provide needed resources for training in today's church. You know, as I have visited the website, it seems to me, and I think this is what you're saying, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Pastors really could use this as um, a, a means of, of educating laity and, you know, to, to give, I mean, when they're done with this, to give some kind of certificate acknowledgement of having gone through this. Um, and it seems like it's a win-win. It's a win for the laity, but it's also a win for the local church. That's right. We've had a, a great uh, response to our catechesis materials. There are literally thousands of these uh, booklets out around the church, people using them to train their new new members. Uh, the Seven Minute Seminary has been very powerful where a professor who really has uh, knowledge in the area will reduce to seven minutes a basic Christian response on things related to the environment, related to uh, homosexuality, related to issues regarding uh, the ratio of church and state. There's no end to questions people have. And so yeah. the Seminary Seminary allows people to gain access to that information fairly succinctly. Um, before we let you go today, a um, couple other things. First, I'd like to talk about theological education within the context of an ever-increasing multicultural, pluralistic environment. Um, I think that it presents challenges, perhaps, you know, that we didn't have. Well, I know that we didn't have 20, 30 years ago. Talk about that a little bit. Well, it's a great point. Uh, in what we call the Christendom world, that is a world that is essentially uh, monoreligious uh, in the Christian formation, then we didn't think a lot about Islam or Hinduism, etc. We didn't really have yeah. a new atheism movement and so forth. Today's uh, young people growing up are in a context that's highly pluralistic. Uh, Christianity seems to be just one of multiple religious options. So it requires the church to more carefully elucidate uh, what is we believe, why we believe it, uh, what is about Christ that is unique, and why do we believe in the supremacy of Christ, 
and then answering specific questions people have uh, about about the gospel that uh, are confusing or need clarification. So we just see that uh, this holistic environment requires different kind of training uh, than perhaps what we were used to uh, 20, 30 years ago. I would assume that your book, uh, Theology in the Context of World Christianity, um, gets at this topic to some degree? It is. Uh, my first earlier book, uh, Christian and the Religious Roundtable, probably more particularly addresses context of other religious questions about, uh, especially from Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. Okay. But the theology book that I wrote did uh, try to see how theology is formed differently from a global context and what we can learn from the global church about the questions that they're facing and how it helps them look at the Bible and hear the message of Christ in their own context. So most of my writing has been trying to negotiate this context of how we uh, are committed to historic Christianity, but an increasingly global and more pluralistic context. How, how have some of those writings been received? Well, been received very well. Uh, these books uh, have been written, uh, the first one was written in 2001. It's still in print. I think it's in the seventh printing. So a lot of my books are being used as textbooks yeah. across the country. So I think that is a good sign. Yep. Uh, our theology book is used uh, here in Asbury as well as many seminaries in the country. So I think that people are learning the importance of addressing these issues, and especially the evangelical community, which came to this a little bit late, uh, yeah. is now fully understood the importance of our addressing some of these issues if we're going to be effective witnesses in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, the reality is this, that we live, uh, even in the culture here in the United States, that um, you might run into a young person that knows more about um, Hinduism or the Muslim faith or, or you know, shades of Eastern mysticism more than they do Christianity. Um, I, I remember I took my first pastorate in 1993. In 1994, we had a young man who came to Christ, and I started uh, doing New Converts lessons with him. And his question for me at the very first uh, New Converts lesson was this, is there something religious about Easter? Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I point out when I tell that story, I point out to people that uh, this wasn't someone who was, you know, reared somewhere else. It, right here in the United States, they grew up here. Um, Absolutely. And it's just the it's just there are things that we can't take for granted anymore. That's so true. Yeah. Well, listen, it is uh, just a pleasure to have you with us today. We're going to do links to all the materials that you have written, and so for those who are listening, they'll be able to just go to our website and access those materials. Um, talk just real quick about your website. Uh, you have We have promoted your website on our show before. Um, um, tell our listeners where they can find you. Thank you. Uh, I can be found at www.timothytenet.com. That's T-I-M-O-T-H-Y-T-E-N-N-E-N-T. -E -E and so I put up a blog once a week uh, or so, and that, of course, opens up all kinds of great interaction. I uh, address various contemporary issues that are coming through and just reflecting theologically on them or reflecting uh, missiologically on those challenges. And so it, it always gets good, robust response. So I yeah. would welcome any of your listeners to uh, log in and check it out. Yeah, I was on there a couple of weeks ago, I guess. You um, actually wrote an article uh, on the issue of homosexuality and why um, this is such a, a central I issue for the church or in the evangelical movement. I thought you did a wonderful job. And as you said, the response to that was robust. So um, your article or your blog was very interesting. All the comments were fascinating as well. And so we really encourage our listeners to head over there uh, and, and take advantage of that. Um, again, thank you so much uh, for your time. We realize it's valuable. And, uh, you know, if you're ever here in South Carolina, there's always a hot cup of tea for you, all right? <laughs> thank you very much, Tony. God but, bless you. Bless it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All righty. Um, yeah, I've had opportunity to be with Dr. Tennant on two or three occasions, and he is a delight to be with. And that little thing about tea there. Um, he and I are both hot tea drinkers, and so we spent quite a bit of time <laughs> just discussing that. Uh, it was pretty hilarious. Um, listen, I want to remind you of our giveaway, um, the biography by uh, Eric Metaxas Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. If you head over to our website, uh, there is a giveaways tab. Just click on that. You can enter as many times as you want to. 
we always make jokes about Seth Cotton. Right now we have close to 100 entries, and you know Matthew joked earlier that by probably 70 of those were Seth. Now, I, I doubt 70, but <laughs> he, I'm are, sure he has a lot. close, man. <laughs> so listen, man, get, get active with this and let other people know. Um, we will uh, give this away next week. There's one more week, and so our goal is to have this shipped out in time for Christmas. We will, um, I- as long as we know the winner next Wednesday and have your address, we will get this out. So if you're thinking, you know, maybe you could win a, a Christmas present for a, a fellow friend, pastor, whatever, uh, we highly recommend that. As as we said, uh, Heath is out due to sickness, but we have his likeness over to my left over here. This yeah. is something that our Can't producer get to put it together. For some reason, why can't I? Come oh, on, rats! There, oh, here we go. Here, here we, we are. are. There it is. Um, I, you know, I've got to say this. I think Heath looks better now than he's ever yeah, looked. Yeah, so, some were saying that that was scary to not show that that was scary, and we were commenting in the chat room that that actually may be less scary than the real thing. Yeah. No. Yeah. Seriously. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, well, uh, the most intelligent conversation we've had out of Heath. <laughs> yeah, very long time. No, sorry. <laughs> I tease. I tease. <laughs> that, was, that was a dear one. I, I hope that I, I hope that Heath watches this episode. I hope so too. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on to download of the week. Yay! Yay! Our download of the week, Teej. Uh, this is one that you are recommending. Yeah. So. Um, Let's get that off of here. I think I've got it to where if I do this and then I do this right here. Cha-ching! Bye. There it is. Cha-ching. All right. right there. So um, this is a cool little program for iOS, and it says on their website, coming soon for Android as well, yep. called Twist. And basically, it is not a get directions, even though it does provide directions. It is a mapping application. But it's not so much as getting directions for you to get to a place as much as it is for you to be kind to the person to whom you are going to be seeing on this trip. So what you do is you pick a destination and uh, the, the address, or you can use the contact list or whatever it is and say, I'm headed here. And uh, when you leave, um, it, it'll ask you, you know, well, beforehand, who do you who do you need to let know that you're on your way? So like on my way here today, yep. I, I chose your number. Uh, and when I headed out, when I, when I left my driveway, uh, this application sent you a message saying, hey, Matthew's on his way. It's going to be about this time. You know, his estimated time of arrival is about here. I used this this past Thursday when I was headed off on a little bit further of a trip. Uh, sent a message to a couple people uh, saying, hey, I'm on my way uh, so that they know. It does it. I didn't have to type that in. It just does it all on its own. It says, hey, Matthew's coming up. Uh, his, uh, his arrival time's about here. I pulled off to the side to get breakfast along the way, which added about 10 minutes to my trip when it realized that that was happening. It sent them another message saying, hey, it's been a small delay. It looks like it's going to be more along this, this time. And then as I was getting closer, uh, once you arrive at the location, uh, it sends them another message saying, hey, oh, great, and it just shut down. <laughs> That's my fault. It just it, it said, uh, hey, he's here. He's He's gotten here, and uh, be looking out your window because yeah. he's somewhere in the, in the area. For me, so, yeah, for me, it sent the initial message that when you were coming, estimated when you would be here, yeah. and then like a minute or two before he got here, it said, hey, he's almost here, and it was like, thanks for the warning. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> so, so this is, again, it'll give you directions. So along along the route here, let's see if this shows up. I don't know if it's going to or not. Uh, Well, there's Google Street View telling me where I'm going and what the weather's like at your house. But uh, somewhere in here, like I guess because the trip has ended, but it, I could have hit that tab and it will sh- it will give you directions. It's not gonna. I don't. I don't remember it doing any kind of audible turn by turn directions or anything like that. And this isn't an application for that. I wouldn't recommend it for that. But if uh, if you're going to be meeting somebody, what a great way. You know, sometimes there's people who are coming. You're kind of on the lookout. I wish UPS used this application. <laughs> <laughs> well, our district superintendent. So you had a meeting with him and you yeah. sent this thing. It gave him updates. He was really impressed with this. Yeah. And I could see for him where if any any he has meetings all over the upstate, well, right. all over the whole state. Right. And so, like, he had to go to a meeting yesterday, lower part of the state. So yeah. if, if this pastor had a smartphone that he was going to see, Not, all, he, all he had to do is 
Doesn't even take a well, smartphone. It, if you can get text right, messages, got, and you can even do email. Like it, it, it's set up. You can do to an email address, whatever it is. Then you can download this application if you did have a smartphone. Uh, and as you go through the sign up process for it, it'll ask you your phone number, and it'll say, "Hey, oh, so this is yours. So would you rather instead of receiving a text message, would you rather it just show up as a notification inside this application on your phone?" So it gives you that option. But uh, yeah, don't the the, the recipient. Yeah. All they have to have is a is an SMS capable device or a uh, an email address, and yeah. both of those it'll work. Yeah, yeah, in the case of Buddy's trip yesterday, it would have just gave them uh, updates periodically yep. where he was yep. uh, headed towards. Uh, yeah, and I, I find that just really handy. You know, if somebody's yeah. coming, you know, you're always kind of on the lookout to be like, okay, when are they going to get here? What's going to happen? Uh, this would have been handy uh, or over Thanksgiving. I was going up to to see. Uh, you know, our family. And on the way, you know, my dad calls me, hey, about how long do you feel like it's going to be? And I had to go, you know, dig through and, and get this estimated time of arrival, figuring this out. And I didn't know about this application that I had never used it before. But it would have been great to, on my way out, to have been able to be like, hey, send my dad a message that I'm on my way. Yeah. And then it would update him periodically saying, it looks like uh, the time's going to be about here. If we had to stop for bathroom breaks, again, adjust for that. And, and this says, is a free app? Yeah, it's a free app. And yeah. it, uh, so when it sends out those emails or those text messages, uh, it doesn't actually, I don't have a text messaging plan. Uh, I have, uh, I can iMessage, you know, on this, but I don't actually, I've got text messaging blocked from coming in or going out on my phone. Yeah. So the service itself sends the text message. Okay. Uh, so Twist themselves from their servers, they they put out that message. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't even see, require I, that. No, I, I'm sure I got the updates via, um, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, it's coming from their server. It's coming from their server. Yeah. So so oh, as as my phone's updating their server, their server's sending out the email, their server's sending out the text message. Once you go, mm -hmm. you don't even have to touch this application again. It just does it all okay. on its own without without any of your interaction Very from it. So yeah, it's a great little application for for free. And I hope it comes to Android soon so our Android uh, brothers and yeah. sisters can enjoy it as well. Um, so speaking of Android, we have a, a, a fella who, um, has become friends of the show over the years. I'm hoping that, yeah, we're going to try. I've been talking too much to actually have pulled him in. We're going to try now, to pull him gonna... in. Jeremy <laughs> Curtis, um, is a listener and, um, we're going to try to pull him in for they said it. Um, Except that he doesn't appear to be online. So okay. Jeremy. Okay. Well, <laughs> well then there, then there won't be any, they said it this week. Uh, Jeremy is um, in our chat room. So, Jeremy, get on Twitter. We're pulling you Twitter, in, man. Twitter, no Skype. Or Skype, that's what I mean. Yeah. Get on Skype. Get off, get off Twitter. And get on and Skype. And get on Skype. Well, I mean, what are you waiting for, man? Well, Is in the meantime, you better think of something to talk about, Tony. I don't have Make anything. this interesting for the viewers. I don't have anything to talk about. I mean, I've pumped the hound out of this book. <laughs> I don't know more, you know, what else I can say. Uh, uh, why don't you read a selection <laughs> from it? Why don't, why don't you do that? I don't, I don't just just read a, read a selection from the book <laughs> while uh, we wait for yeah. Jeremy to come on on Skype here. Yeah. The, the, the whole show will be me reading the rest of the way. Yeah, it'd be pretty hard for us to do. They said it without um, someone else here unless it, Matthew and I had the discussion last week that I have this uh, gift of being able to take both sides of any issue, but I, I really don't want to argue with myself. Um, I do enough of that uh, during alone time. So, let's see here. This may be the chance we're this, about to find out. Is this it? Is this? We're just gonna wing it. I'm just contacting every Jeremy Gertis that's listed on Skype. So, <laughs> who knows who we could be getting here? Well, we, yeah. Well, instead of getting a Jeremy Gertis in Iowa, we might get one like in California. It's hard something. to tell, man. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa! Hey, okay. This is sounding hopeful. This guy looks familiar. He kind of looks like the guy that I know as the uh, real Jeremy Gertis. There he is. Okay. Wow. Woo. He looks like a flower child. <laughs> he's, got the, he's got the blue flower behind him there on the wall. <laughs> hey, you guys are just jealous. <laughs> no, no, we're not. We're not jealous, Jeremy. I promise oh. you we're not. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, you guys do have good, better backgrounds than I do. I, you know... I'm just not as cool as you, though, Tony. I, I can't put up Joanne Lyon and Martin Luther and John Wesley and them and call them my personal friends. Well, I don't. I mean, well, Joanne's my personal friend. I mean, these other people are dead, so it's hard for me to call them my personal friends. All right, listen, let's let's jump in here and let's talk about they said it. Judges, they made my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. Took the initiative in creating the internet. The Macintosh 
Of all the machines I've ever seen, it is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you if you know what you're doing here, slide slide out. Okay, so that was go. fun. <laughs> and go, action. go, Jeremy. <laughs> Judges, they make rulings. They make them kind of hastily. So if that's what he feels one of my conditions should be, then I'm going to abide by it. 44-year-old Corey Curtis reacting to a judge's order that he may not have any more children as a condition of his probation source, WDJT-TV. I have no problem with people in this country trying to earn a profit, but I would ask them, would they do this to their own children or their own neighborhood in their own home state? West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin requesting that MTV not follow through with its plans to air Buckwild, a reality show that chronicles the lives of a group of foul-mouthed, wild-living teenagers from West Virginia. Source, The Washington Post. Next year, we're going to bring some production to the U.S. on the Mac. We've been working on this for a long time, and we're getting closer to it. It will happen in 2013. We're really proud of it. We could have quickly maybe done just assembly, but it's broader because we wanted to do something more substantial. So we'll, liter we'll literally invest over $100 million. This doesn't mean that Apple will do it ourselves, but we'll be working with people and we'll be investing our money. Apple CEO Tim Cook announcing that the company will bring back to the United States some of its Mac computer assembly source, The Verge. First and foremost, we would like to express our deep and sincere condolences to the family for their loss. We are very sorry for what has happened. Ray is Holleran, network director for a radio station where DJs Mel Craig and Michael Christian impersonating Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles, called the hospital Tuesday, December the 4th, 2012, and gained some information about the condition of Catherine. It is believed the nurse who gave the information committed suicide over the prank, and the DJs have been fired. All right here. So um, that last one that I just read gets your attention really fast, and it's kind of big news right now. I saw it. Uh, there was a point of discussion on the Today Show. Uh, it's, been, it's been, yeah, for a long yeah. time. It's been, well, ever since it actually happened. Today there was actually a lot of sympathy for the DJs over this. And so on the Today Show, that was, you know, uh, feeling bad because, um, so I'm, you know, he, here's, here's my take on this. Whenever you pull a prank, somebody has to be the butt of that joke. It has to be the butt of that prank. Um, so we're hoping that he <laughs> will not take his life. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so I mean, I'm I'm curious, Jeremy. What I mean, uh, certainly this isn't the first time you've seen this story, and it's been around for the last few days. I mean, what do, what do you think on this one? What do I think? Wow, you know, there's so many different variables at play here. Should they have pulled the joke in the first place? Well, it's probably a stupid joke to pull, but. Do you hold them responsible for the nurse going off the deep end? And man, I don't know. I don't know. Well, for me, if, before if they had a pattern of this kind of behavior, maybe. But 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 know. before you can take that or, or make that call, uh, I just like for me, it's like, well, what else happened between when it actually happened? Like, did she like get just chewed out big time by by her superiors? Like, yeah, we don't if, know. Uh, it, it's such a I mean, from what it sounds like, and I don't know the the whole deal, but from what it sounds like, it's like no, we were all like, no, oh, it's okay, it's okay, like we understand it was a prank or whatever. So what what was it that just brought about if that was the case, and it appears to be, what was it that just took it to that extreme level where it's just like I just can't take this? That's that's also, it's just almost bizarre to me. As I read this story, um, I, I think that the station is actually being a little bit hypocritical because they've been pulling these kind of pranks for a long time. So they, you know, on this show, part of the, as I understand it, part of the shtick of this sh show is that they will call live and impersonate people. Um, and so, you know, management's never stepped in before. And so at this point, to put it all on the DJs, I'm not, I'm not sure it's fair. Now, at the same time... You know, if if the safest thing to do if you're going to play jokes is make yourself the butt of the joke, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about anyone going off the deep end. Um, because when you pull pranks, someone, it's always at the expense of somebody. You know? So I thought it was cool, Jeremy. You're a Google guy, so I had you reading the Apple announcement. 
it's all good. I'm talking to you guys today on a Mac, so it's all good. Oh, oh no! Hold on. No! This is new. Jeremy! No, it's not new. I, my primary computer's been a Mac since 2007, and it would have been a lot earlier okay. than that if I wasn't poor and, you know. How did we not know that? A I, loser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. So, I mean, what do you think of this story here? I, I think I think it's about time. You know, the, the reality is Apple did produce Macs in the United States for a long time, and they shipped them overseas because it was cheaper. I they've had a lot of bad press about Foxconn and all yep. the abuses that are going on over there with in their supply chain. So it's about time that they did this. What concerns me is that on the bottom of the source article at The Verge. They do have a little update that says that Foxconn has now confirmed that they're also expanding in North America. And so I would, I suspect that it'll be Apple is helping Foxconn to build a factory e in North e America exactly. somewhere. That's exactly so what it is. They won't actually be distancing themselves from Foxconn. It's just. So, in my estimation, with a company that has over how much in the bank? A hundred billion, more than a hundred billion yeah. in the bank. Something like that. To say we're investing a hundred million in in building in the U.S., that's a hundred million dollars of marketing for a hundred billion dollar company. Uh, that that's that's like, oops, you know. I, I mean, Apple could the, the, a window could be left open in Tim Cook's office, and he could have a hundred million dollars on his desk, and it could just kind of blow out the window, and nobody would even chase that down. Like that would just be it would be gone. I don't even know that they'd notice that a hundred million dollars had had you know just kind of mysteriously disappeared. Uh, I think it's great, but I think that it's that it's a hundred million dollars worth of PR. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about for over a year coming up on two years this whole manufacturing Absolutely. foxconn everything that's that's gone on uh so it really it gains them a huge save of face in the in the public eye here in america um but it would be incredible to hear them say hey we're putting a couple billion dollars to this and it's not just one of our five different models of computers we're moving yeah. uh all of our all of our uh assembly all of all of that now i realize parts and stuff that go into that not everything can be made here um cook noted that some of the stuff that's in a current iphone is like the glass and the processor and all that is manufactured here as he was talking about all of that but um I, I think that would be a much more like if that's the heart if it's like yeah we want to get back to america you're a hundred billion dollar you got a hundred billion dollars in the bank you could build you wouldn't even have to be foxconn doing it for you you yeah. could build all your own manufacturing for every one of your own products and get them all <laughs> all the components shipped here you could do that if you wanted to so all all that i estimates happening here until I, I think that this is an experiment i think it's them dipping their toes in the water i think it's saying how uh, we'll, we'll wait and kind of see how this is perceived by the general public but overall this isn't significant for that company just because of the size that that company is. This is, this is uh, yeah. oh, cool, a, a fun little... John C. Yeah. Borak calls it $100 million worth of, of good press. Um, I, I, th I think, though, I mean, doesn't this put a little bit of pressure on HP, Lenovo, everyone? Because everyone makes... At least, all these devices are made at Foxconn, not just Apple. What were you going to say, Jeremy? You start saying something. Lenovo's... Well I agree. It does put pressure on these guys, unless, of course, they're just going to continue doing business with Foxconn in North America now. Uh, but I, I, I was going to point out here that the $100 billion that Apple has in the bank is their cash or cash equivalent. Uh, they have a whole lot more in, in facilities and yeah. people and all sorts of stuff. So $100 billion is a drop in the bucket for them even. Yeah, yeah their evaluation is much um, greater than what they have in the bank. Yeah, and I, I would also point out one of the things that concerned me about uh, this article here. Uh, it points out that uh, uh, Mr. Cook doesn't think that he could completely manufacture Macintosh computers in the United States because our school system isn't geared toward equipping students and graduates to yep. build in modern manufacturing processes. Yeah, that's exactly I, what Steve Jobs I, said. Hey, I don't think that, that's, that, that, that he's off base, though, with that. I agree. He's not. And that's one of the things that alarms me a lot about our current economy. And, uh, you know, all these people keep saying we got to make stuff to have an economy that's booming. But 
we don't have people that are wanting or equipped yeah. to make stuff. It's about the engineers and all that. I want to go back. I want to backtrack just a little bit. Pressure maybe on Hewlett Packard as they are a, an American company. But like you threw Lenovo's name in there. That's a Chinese company now. They bought ThinkPad from IBM, an American company. I but thought Lenovo was Korean. Oh well, okay, so maybe Korean. I don't know. Where, I mean, where is I don't, Lenovo? If someone out there knows, hold on, Jer- Jeremy. What is it? What Jeremy? I believe they are Chinese. Okay, I think oh, okay. I thought so too. I thought so. So Korean. I'm not sure that you can say you know just across the board that everybody feels that same pressure. I do think that American manufacturing should feel that pressure. But then again, like we say that all we want, but what do we? What are we gonna do? the moment that stuff starts getting a little bit more expensive because the the cost of building then we're going to be the ones we're it's out of out of the same mouths that say bring manufacturing to the united states <laughs> will come wow man yeah. price is going up and we've we've become so accustomed to where they're at and this just isn't fair we don't like this wah, wah, wah. and the, the estimate for bringing the iphone totally uh, production totally in the united states is that it would add 57 dollars per phone so, I've heard so many different numbers on that. So I'd love to know the source because I think that there's a bunch of different people that have thrown out a bunch of different numbers. What we do know is it'd be more expensive. And if your price goes up on something that you're used to paying X amount of dollars for, if you have to if you have to buy a discipline for seven dollars when it used to maybe you could have gotten that for, for free, what are we gonna do? We're gonna sit around and cry and say, oh, where are we are <laughs> I've heard that argument this? before. We're used to this for free. Give it to us for free. <laughs> All right, let's let's jump into these other two stories. Um, <laughs> the the story, the first one that you read, Jeremy. Um, this is a, you know, I I applaud the judge here. This guy has has nine kids with six different women. He's a hundred thousand dollars behind on his child support, and so as a matter of his probation, forty four year old Corey Curtis cannot father any more children. How are they enforcing that? I have no idea. Will he be castrated? Uh, I mean, no, they can't castrate him. They cannot. Uh, sterilize him because that would remove his constitutional right of procreation. I've read the Constitution a couple of times. I don't remember procreation (laughs) being in there. The right to... (laughs) (laughs) Okay, the exact wording isn't there. It's all under the thing of freedom. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to police this. Are are you like, are you putting an application in? No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to think logically how this is going to happen i mean i mean what what else are the courts supposed to do this is ridiculous i mean he wears this like a badge what were you gonna say jeremy oh i i was just gonna say you're right it is ridiculous when you have nine kids with six women it's it's and you're a hundred thousand dollars behind in your child support payment it's obvious that you are not really into the kids you're into the sex um, but I, I would also point out before we go pointing a finger at this guy in particular, our culture is broken. There, there's no getting around that. Mm. And as long as our culture is broken, we're going to have stuff like this happening. Yeah, especially if you uh, we are constantly bombarded with trying to separate um, morality from sex uh, as if there should be no <laughs> boundaries or guidelines in this area of our life. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. All right, this last story here, MTV, uh, their new show, Buck Wild. Uh, uh, yeah, Jersey, they, they canceled. I've not even heard about this. Yeah, they so. canceled Jersey Shore. Now they're who, did the, who did oh, the research Heath, for this? Heath, of course Heath did the Heath. research for this. Let's, so let's turn to Heath for what his opinion Heath? on this. See, look at he's perplexed. It looks by the like whole this thing. show might give him some indigestion, maybe a little bit of bad <laughs> gas. If we're unsure, uh, but he, that's all we got from you right now, man. Could you be a little bit more specific? Okay, um, well, I, I applaud the senator here for pointing this out. You know, Doug Christie really got after MTV for Jersey Shore. That show has finally been canceled. Chris, Chris um, Christie, the governor. Yeah, yeah Chris Christie. Christie yeah. Um, Doug Christie used to be a kicker for the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> um, yeah, Chris Christie, uh, and and you know he's he said I he reminded people all the time this doesn't represent our state, um, and he thought it was a travesty. And in West Virginia, they're just trying to get out in front of it, uh, trying to get MTV to acknowledge um, that this is not good. If if you follow our website here, you can play just a little clip. Um, and I thought it was interesting the morning news show on CBS. They, they, uh, I mean, the the two anchors there uh, applauded the senator for calling this kind of stuff out. Uh, well, I, I agree. This is crazy stuff. The sad thing is Governor Christie's protests to MTV still did nothing. I mean, MTV 
ran the show and they ran it until it didn't have anybody watching it. Yeah, I guess. you know, you, so again, you know, you know, it'll get again. shows like this to not be aired is if people didn't watch them. I mean, that isn't that the okay? <laughs> why do we? Absolutely. Why do? Yeah, that's that's it. So there's obviously a sensation there that uh, a lot of people desire, and that's a again, it's a it's a sad thing. Let's go, honey. Honey, little little honey boo boo or whatever it is. <laughs> like, have you ever heard of that show or seen see that? It. Like, you've seen it, yeah. <laughs> Why yeah. does a show like this exist? What in the world? And yet, people eat it up. So if they people eat it up, it's going to be on the air. So I haven't seen Honey Boo Boo. Am I really missing something? No. Uh, I, th- I think everybody should. Everybody should probably at least familiarize yourself just no. so you can know. <laughs> hey, listen, before we close the show, Jeremy, I ne- we had you on back in July during our big 4th of July barbecue episode. I think we had you on. Yeah, I didn't share anything. It was it was cruel. Man. <laughs> um, but uh, our point of interest was you uh, you went to the developer conference, the Google developer conference, came back with the Nexus 7 um, and you gave it to your wife. I, I assume she's still using it, still likes it. Um, yes. <laughs> oh, hold on. Is that all you I, know? If I wanted that tablet back, I would have to pry it from her cold, dead fingers. Okay. <laughs> Does she use Google now? I do use Google now. I, I use it a lot more on the on the uh, Galaxy Nexus that I have, the little phone. Okay. So I mean, do you like it? Do you, is is it is it just like an interesting thing, or do you find it to be productive? I do find it to be productive. Um, the speech recognition thing isn't nearly as productive as other stuff. But uh, Google now, it displays like uh, instantaneous weather updates, you know, all the time. So I have real-time weather going on on the thing. Uh, if, I, if I do a local search, even on my computer for, say, McDonald's, well, I wouldn't do McDonald's probably. I'd probably do something more like Italian restaurant in Des Moines or something like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, it, it automatically pulls up directions in Google Now on the phone so that as soon as I get to my phone, I can flick that up and, oh, look, there's the directions to find that restaurant I was looking for. And yeah. Just go to it. Yeah. TG's dying to show you something. No, no. Here. What? Dying, dying what? to play. What? Oh, come on. Come on now. Come on. It's not where this is a fail. Come on, it is. All right, one more time. Here we go. What's the weather like in Des Moines? It's 36 degrees and partly cloudy in Des Moines. Don't know if anyone could hear that. 36 degrees 36 and partly degrees? cloudy in Des Moines. Is that true, Jeremy? Um, I haven't been outside for about an hour. I would guess that it's pretty close. <laughs> but look, that's what oh, it took Oh, there me. we go. Just a flick of the finger and there it is. How about that? Do you How know, I that? have a friend who has a um, Galaxy, uh, what is it, what is it, a Samsung Galaxy 3 phone. He likes Google Now. Um, he also has a Nexus 7 tablet. He actually likes it for the traffic. So when he gets up in the morning, he his, it's about 45 minutes away over in Spartanburg. He works at the BMW plant. And so he gets an immediate traffic report. I mean, it's it's waiting for him. Mm-hmm. And, and so he already knows what to anticipate. So that has become a real feature that he likes on Google Now. And and mine would do that if I lived in a city where they tracked, you know, the traffic <laughs> and deploying. Well, and if you have a regular commute too, um, if you like, for him who's <laughs> daily, like he 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 yeah. works every day, you know, there same time, so like it figures that out very very quickly. That okay, this must be your workplace. If you're, you know, if you work from home or if <laughs> my my directions to work, you know, to the church, it's like okay, the estimated walking time <laughs> out of your back door up to the church is about. Two minutes, minutes. <laughs> and there's yeah, right. there's a couple of ant hills along the way. Don't <laughs> step in them, man. <laughs> Actually, one time it thought that uh, my commute to work was to the grocery store because I went to the grocery store every day for like five days straight, and I was like, oh, well, that is kind of true, but. <laughs> Well, Jeremy, uh, thanks so much for uh, uh, pinch hitting there for our They Said It segment. Hey, I'm, I'm just glad you guys didn't make me ride a buffalo. Yeah, well, you know, if we listen, Next we got time. we got a guy who owns buffaloes. I mean, right down the road from me. So if we ever if we ever do that, here's my commitment to you: we will play for your airfare for you to ride the buffalo. Okay? <laughs> Joy. No, I, I just want to see the video of Heath riding the buffalo. <laughs> okay. Can it can it be 
Can it be the gumball machine? <laughs> <laughs> Can Heath make that face and wear that hat? <laughs> I, that turned out so spectacular. It, it really did. It really is. It's such a great likeness. Uh, and listen, next week on our show, um, we have with us uh, Nina Rosner. She is the author of The Respect Dare. Um, I, Thomas Nelson actually contacted us about this and wondered if we'd be interested in having her on the show. We said, yeah. Uh, they sent me a bio. Interesting story. Uh, she talks about her own marriage, um, and there's a lot that goes behind this and that her marriage was just failing, and she came to the conclusion that part of uh, the, the problem was her and that she simply um, wasn't submitting to her spouse, and so she's going to talk about that. Um, and certainly within the Scripture, one of the things that we do highlight is uh, submitting to one another, our husbands and wives, and so... Um, ought to be a great conversation. Again, the author or the title of the book is The Respect Dare. It's out today, and we will have that author on with us next week. Jeremy, uh, where can our listeners find you on the internet? I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, and I have a blog at jgertis.wordpress.com. Spell Gertis for our listeners. <laughs> Spell Gertis. Can you hear me? G E E R D E S. All right. Matthew. Not even close to how it sounds. Yeah, that's right. You can find me at Matthew T I E T J E dot com. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was always some kind of reward if they could figure it out. It is. Yeah. Well, but that lasted long enough. Yeah. Everybody knows. I'm now. on Twitter at AKC64. Well, if you want to do further research on anything we discussed today, you can find all the links to the stories we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. If you want to contact us, send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail by calling us at 3049-TEOLOGY. That's 304-986-5649. Leave a message, and we may even play your comments on the air. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.